So now to close out this lecture and the idea of aquatic biomes, we're going to end by looking at some real life examples of aquatic biomes. So we'll entitle this last flowchart examples and specifically of aquatic biomes. Just to ground ourselves on the fact that these do show up in real life. It's not just a bunch of facts that we're throwing out at you. There are actual real life examples of these very diverse, very complicated systems of life known as biomes within aquatic environments. So let's start off by looking at the lakes. Lakes represent themselves as very nice studies of aquatic biomes. Here, we have to always ground our understanding on the physical environment. The physical environment is what defines an aquatic biome. So what is important about the physical environment of a lake? This is going to be the fact that lakes are standing bodies of water. That is their physical environment. They don't move. They don't flow. They're pretty much a standing in that, in that sense. And this could go all the way from the smallest of ponds to the largest of lakes, let's say. Any of these in between would give us a lake physical environment, a standing body of water, essentially. In addition to the physical environment, we can also study the chemical environment of these lakes. And that will give us a lot of important information in this example. Chemical environment of lakes will often involve the studying of salinity, how salty the lake is or how unsalty the lake is. Another important environmental component in terms of chemistry is the concentration of oxygen, so bracket O2. Also, the concentration of nutrients, let's say, so we'll call this nutrient content, will also be very, very important in studying the chemical environment. And the thing is about all of these is that they all vary meaning that they are all very, very different uh, widely. If you look at one lake and look at a different lake, its salinity, its oxygen concentration, its nutrient content will vary very widely from lake one and lake two, or lake A versus lake B. So that's the big thing that we study as ecologists to see the differences and see where we have deviations. A good way to classify this chemical environment is through two key terms based off of nutrient content. Because we know that nutrient content plays a big role in everything that lives because these are nutrients that provide life. So we can look at, let's say, an oligotrophic environment, an oligotrophic chemical environment of a lake specifically. Oligo means few. And what we're talking about here is that when we say oligo, this is just an O here, oligo would mean few, trophic referring to few, food. So here we have a pretty much a nutrient poor environment. But even though it's nutrient poor, it will actually be oxygen O2 rich. That will be the direct if and then consequence here. And lastly, in this few trophic environment, we're going to have a low amount of decomposable organisms, decompose, uh, decompose, I want to make sure I spell this rightly, decomposable organism or organic matter for that reason, organic matter in sediments. So let me just repeat that one more time. In the oligotrophic chemical environment of lakes, we have nutrient-poor regions, uh, we have oxygen-rich regions, and then we have a low amount of decomposable organic matter in sediments because there's not that many nutrients. Thus, there's not that many things dying, living things, let's say, dying, and thus there's less decomposable matter. In a eutrophic chemical environment, which is the exact, let's say, opposite that we see, in this eutrophic chemical environment, this true trophic chemical environment, we have a nutrient-rich environment, a nutrient-rich biome. And thus, we will also have, consequentially, a rather oxygen-poor biome. Because all of these things that are living here are, have all these nutrients that they need to break down, so they need lots of oxygen to break down all of these nutrients, basic cell respiration. And for that reason, we will have a high amount of decomposable matter. High amount of decomposable organic matter. 
and if we have a high amount of decomposable organic matter, that's all in relation to the nutrients, because nutrients play a critical role in the trophicness, let's say, the trophic characteristic of our chemical environment. And now, in addition to this chemical and physical environment of lakes, we have to, of course, refer to our photosynthetic organisms. What role do they play in lakes? In lakes specifically, photosynthetic organisms usually occupy two zones, and these are zones we've covered. The littoral zone is important in photosynthetic organism, or organismal study, and also the limnetic zone will be important. So let's look at both. In the littoral zone, photosynthetic organisms are usually, since this is the litter zone, it's close to the shore, rooted. And also, uh, we usually have some floating plants as well because there, there's a litter here. So it's rooted and floating aquatic plants show up here. So that's our littoral zone of photosynthetic organisms. And in the limnetic zone, what we have here are usually not rooted or floating plants because this is a little bit further out in the water. We actually usually see phytoplankton. Phytoplankton we see, and we also usually see um, a lot of cyanobacteria as well. We see a lot of cyanobacteria. Phytoplankton are single-celled protists, so we're going to write that down in very small letters here just to remind ourselves that these are protists. And cyanobacteria, of course, bacteria. All, all, both of these things are microscopic. You can't really see them, but they're still there in great quantity. They're all, both of them are photosynthetic. They rely primarily on photosynthesis, and they also are both single-celled organisms. So that's what we see in the limnetic zone in terms of photosynthetic organisms of lakes. And then in the littoral zone, we do see real physical plants that are either rooted or floating uh, on the lake surface, near the, sh near the shore probably. Um, in addition to the lake example, we can look at an example of streams and rivers. And we'll do that one over here. Let's look at streams and rivers. So now we had a standing body of water here. Streams and rivers are certainly not standing, and these are going to be moving bodies of water. So we're going to have bits of a lot of differences in terms of physical and chemical environment. So let's see what we have. In the physical environment of streams and rivers, we're going to have the following. First and foremost, moving water. Streams and rivers have water that is constantly moving. And thus, if we have moving water in streams and rivers, a big point of study will be the fact that not that this is going to be of great, this is variable as well, but what's more important is to study the moving water variability. So we're going to study in this, we have a great focus on the speed and volume that varies. And if the speed and volume varies, we can study many different things based off of that speed and volume of the moving water. So that's of interest to us. Also in the physical environment, we have a region called the headwaters region. This is going to usually be a rather cold water, it's going to be clear water, and it's also going to be quite turbulent water, very fast moving water. Cold, clear, and turbulent, those are the headwaters. And then we have the downstream physical environment as well. In the downstream physical environment of streams and rivers, we have warmer water usually here and we have uh, more turbid water as well. And when we think of turbidity, T-U-R-B-I-D, we just think of cloudier. It's more cloudy. It's less clear. Over here I said clear. Over here it's more turbid. It's cloudier. In addition, the chemical environment of streams and rivers is also of interest to us as aquatic biologists, as aquatic biome studying students. In the chemical environment, we can observe at the headwaters the following. So the headwaters, again, physically speaking, is cold, clear, and turbulent. In the headwaters, because it's cold, clear, and turbulent, we get a physical con a, a chemical consequence of being O2 rich, and with O2 rich, we are usually nutrient poor. So that's the exact chemical uh, consequence that we saw here as well. And then, of course, we have to observe the downstream because we have established the headwaters. So what happens in the downstream chemical environment? Here is exactly what you would think. We have um, less O2 and we have a higher nutrient content. That's of greater interest to us in the O2 and the downstream scenario. And because of that, we probably have less O2 as well. And then finally, 
in streams and rivers, again, it's also important. We always have to study those photosynthetic organisms as individuals. How do they play a big role? In streams and rivers, photosynthetic organisms uh, vary greatly. They vary from the smallest of phytoplankton, let's say, to the largest of rooted plants. From phytoplankton to rooted plants. So there's a, a large variety of many different photosynthetic organisms, much like there are in lakes, but it's less separated in this littoral versus limnetic zone of lakes. Here we don't have that much of a separation. We have more of a cohesiveness because the water is constantly moving. Finally, the last example to study today of aquatic biomes uh, is the ocean pelagic zone. So what happens here? What happens in the vast ocean that we see? Again, we always root ourselves on the physical and chemical and photosynthetic environments. In the physical environment here, we have open water. And in this open water environment, we usually are going to have this idea of it constantly, this open water will be constantly mixed with the climate that we uh, established in our previous flowcharts. Mixed with or by, let's say, with winds and currents. So the open water will be constantly be moving around, being mixed over and over and over again by the winds and currents of the climate uh, specifically. We'll also look at the chemical environment here. In the ocean pelagic zone, in the chemical environment, we usually have a rather high O2 concentration. And then we have a lower nutrient levels um, than coastal water, let's say, because it's an open water environment. So there's lower nutrients than uh, what we would consider the coastal environment. This is the open water environment, the pelagic zone. The coastal environment will have a bit more nutrients because it's closer to water, closer to land, and thus we saw those consequences show up over and over and over again. Finally, in terms of photosynthetic organisms, we can say the following of the ocean pelagic zone. Usually here in this open water, we have tons and tons of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton play a critical role, as you can see in all of these examples of aquatic biomes. So it's probably a very important thing to understand, the role of these phytoplankton. These are essentially our dominant producers in the ocean pelagic zone. And so they play a critical role in the ecology of all of these water environments that we studied. That concludes our study of biomes and aquatic ecology. Hopefully through this you've gained a greater appreciation, of course, of the complexity that we see. We have zoomed out and scoped ourselves very far out from that original point of study at the population ecology level, and we've gone to community and environmental and ecosystem, and now we're all the way at these large, expansive biomes. Hopefully you can appreciate the complexity once again and understand that many things are interacting in this study of ecology that we have so nicely labeled out.